Pan poseł Agniu. Thank you, Chairman. Well, just three groups of comments, uh, one to each speaker. Um, for the first speaker, who came from the Netherlands, uh, you, you were saying that the, the dynamic is for farms to get bigger and bigger, but there is another dynamic at work here, and this is where a farmer has two sons, and they work with him in the business, and they work together quite well. It's when their sons want to come involved that problems can arise, and often the solution there is to actually divide the holding. And so it, the farm actually gets considerably smaller. It becomes perhaps three or four farms, and I can cite several examples of that. So that is a dynamic that's working in, in the opposite direction. Um, sm small farms can actually really support the larger farms, and, and, and I'm thinking in terms of seed multiplication, where a smaller farm is prepared to take the attention to detail that's required in, in multiplying up breeder's stock, where very light, low seed rates are used because the seed is so expensive, and the attention to detail given by the smaller farmer is more than you would probably get from a larger farmer because they've just got all the worries of a huge acreage, etc. Uh, and you can take this into the livestock sector where... Uh, you have a big dairy unit, and they want to concentrate purely on producing milk, but they knew need somebody to perhaps rear the calves, rear them up to heifers, even get them in calf for the first calf. And they will look perhaps to a smaller farmer, maybe an upland farmer, to, to do that for them. So there are roles to play here. Uh, our speaker from Eastern Europe, obviously things are changing very rapidly there after years of the Soviet regime. Uh, but I wouldn't worry too much about the increasing average age. In 1970, when I was a, a mere student, I can remember being told at college that there was an impending disaster. The average age of farmers in Britain was 58 years old, and if the government didn't do something very proactively about this to really get engaged and involved in this, we were going to see an impending disaster with people just too old to work the land. Well, the government didn't do anything about this, and I was intrigued to hear at a meeting a year ago somebody saying, do you know the average age of farmers in Britain is 57? And if we don't do something about this, we're going to get an impending disaster. So don't worry too much, please. Things do sort themselves out, and people do largely know when to retire. Um, just on a lighter note, you said that agriculture wasn't sexy. Uh, the Young Farmers Federation of uh, Great Britain might not agree with you there. Uh, going on to the, the final uh, presentation from, from the person from Italy, um, I think there's an awful lot you say that it might be all right in theory, but in practice it doesn't really work. So if you look at bargaining power, and yes, you have a, a producer's organization, but it's got to be very, very big, because if it says to its members, hold firm, don't accept a lower price, what that can do is actually benefit other producer organizations elsewhere who benefit from the price rise because their competitors in producer organizer number one aren't doing anything. And that can be a, a real difficulty that the wrong people gain from this. And in any case, it's very difficult to just stop production as a farmer. You can't just tell the cows to stop producing milk. You can't tell the hens to stop laying eggs. You can't. You've also got a problem where with beef and meat animals, they get beyond the point of good sale value. They're, they're getting too big and out of specification. So it's a lot harder to do this in practice than it is in theory. And if you then say, well, all right, we'll have a really big producer organization, a massive one, so if they go on strike, so to speak, uh, it really would make a difference, then I would think most member states, certainly mine, have competition laws, etc., where that makes that impossible. So we are always on the wrong side of the, of the road here. It's very, very tough. I do know that in Argentina, farmers go on strike, but it's after they've harvested the maize and the soybeans, so they're all there in store, and I've known that they will gang together and refuse to sell it unless the price goes up. And I think that can be successful, but it's only in the arable crops that are in store. So there are just a few comments, Chairman. Thank you very much. What can be done from a competition point of view? And I hear MEP Agnew mention there's strong competition law in the UK. I'd love to see how it's operated because it's actually an area that I'm on about. What can be done to 
chop down or minimise the size of these people, whether they be uh, meat factories, whether they be supermarkets, whether they be uh, large dairies, what exactly can be done to reduce their size? Mr. Angry. Thank you, Chairman, for a second bite of the cherry. As Mr. Flanagan mentioned my name, um, I'd like to respond to you. Maybe we're, to we're talking at slightly at cross purposes. The example I'm going to give you about the way the competition law works in Britain is as follows. There were two egg packers. One was called Stonegate, the other was called Dean's. And they merged to make a very powerful force for the supermarkets to have to deal with. The British authorities said, sorry, you can't merge, you're too big. You could make the price of eggs higher for the consumer, therefore we are ordering you to demerge. That's what's happened. 